we ended part way through chapter 28 of Exodus last week, and we're just getting into the garb of the Levite priests. Now, pardon me for being repetitive, but we, we need to remember that it was the tribe of Levi that was set apart as the priestly tribe for God. Now, even though we use the general de designation of the tribe of Levi as the priestly tribe, that does not mean that all Levites were priests. While all members of the tribe of Levi were to be involved in the service to the tabernacle in one form or another, later on the temple, only some of the Levites would become actual priests, meaning those who officiate the sacrificial rituals, with the remainder being equivalent to the blue-collar laborers who did various needed tasks around the tabernacle, like cleaning up or guard duty. So while we tend to bandy about the term Levite priests, as though it's two synonymous terms, Levites and priests, in fact, only a few Levites ever became priests, and that was determined solely by which of the several clans of Levites they were born into. The high priest was supposed to come only from the descendants of Aaron, and then only from the line descended from Aaron's son, Eleazar. That said, that's that not actually what always happened in later times. Well, now on to the high priest whose clothing was distinct from all the other priests. So turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 28. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 91. And we're going to read chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. Follow along with me, please. You are to summon your brother Aharon, Aaron, and his sons to come from among the people of Israel to you so that they can serve me as Kohanim, as priests. Aaron and his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. You are to make for your brother Aharon garments set apart for serving God, expressing dignity and splendor, and speak to all the craftsmen to whom I've given the spirit of wisdom. Have them make Aaron's garments to set him apart for me so that he can serve me in the office of priest. The garments they are to make are these, a breastplate, a ritual vest, a robe, a checkered tunic, a turban, and a sash. And they are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron and his son so that he can serve me in the office of priest. They are to use gold, purple, and scarlet yarn, a gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen. They are to make the ritual vest of gold, of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and a finely woven linen crafted by a skilled artisan. Attached to its front and back edges are to be two shoulder pieces that can be fastened together. Its decorated belt is to be of the same workmanship and materials. Gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on one stone, six remaining names on the other, in the order of their birth. An engraver should engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones as he would engrave a seal. Mount the stones in gold settings. Put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the vest as stones calling to mind the sons of Israel. Aaron is to carry their names before Adonai on his two shoulders as a reminder. Make gold squares and two chains of pure gold twisted like cords. Attach the cord-like chains to the squares. Make a breastplate for judging. Have it crafted by a skilled artisan. Make it like the work of the ritual vest. Make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. When folded double, it's to be square, a hand span by a hand span. Put on it settings of stones, four stones in a row. The first row is to be a carnelian, a topaz, and an emerald. The second row a green feldspar, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, an orange zircon, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They are to be mounted in their gold settings, and the stones will correspond to the names of the twelve sons of Israel. They are to be graved, engraved with their names as a seal would be engraved to represent the twelve tribes. 
On the breastplate, make two pure gold chains twisted like cords. Also for the breastplate, make two gold rings and put the gold rings on the two ends of the breastplate and put the two twisted gold chains and the two rings at the two ends of the breastplate. Attach the two ends of the twisted chains to the front of the shoulder pieces of the ritual vest. Make two gold rings and put them onto the two ends of the breastplate at its edge on the face on the side facing in the in towards the vest. Also make two gold rings and attach them low on the front part of the vest's shoulder pieces near the join above the vest's decorated belt. Then bind the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the vest with a blue cord so that it can be on the vest's decorated belt and so that the breastplate won't swing loose from the vest. Aaron will carry the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate for judging over his heart when he enters the holy place as a continued reminder before Adonai. You are to put the Urim and Tumim in the breastplate for judging. They will be over Aaron's heart when he goes into the presence of Adonai. Thus Aaron will always have the means for making decisions for the people of Israel over his heart when he's in the presence of Adonai. You are to make the robe for the ritual vest entirely of blue. It is to have an opening for the head in the middle, and around the opening is to be a border woven like the neck of a coat of mail so that it won't tear. On the bottom hem, make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet. Put them all the way around with gold bells between them all the way around. Gold bell, pomegranate, gold bell, pomegranate, all the way around the hem of the robe. Aaron is to wear it before min wear it when he ministers and its sound will be heard whenever he enters the holy place before Adonai and when he leaves so that he won't die. You are to make an ornament of purple gold, uh, purple, uh, ornament of pure gold and engrave on it as on a seal set apart for Adonai. Fasten it to the turban with a blue cord on the front of the turban over Aaron's forehead because Aaron bears the guilt for any errors committed by the people of Israel in consecrating their holy gifts, this ornament is always to be on his forehead so that the gifts for Adonai will be accepted by him. You are to weave the checkered tunic of fine linen. Make a turban of fine linen. Make a belt, the work of a weaver in colors. Likewise for Aaron's sons, make tunics, sashes, and headgear expressing dignity and splendor. With them clothe your brother Aaron and his sons, then anoint them, inaugurate them, consecrate them, so that they will be able to serve me in the office of priest. Also make for them linen shorts reaching from waist to thigh to cover their bare flesh. Aaron and his sons are to wear them when they go into the tent of meeting and when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they won't incur guilt and die. This is to be a perpetual regulation both for him and for his descendants. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Working from the inside out, the high priest, just as the lower priests, was to wear breeches, underwear, kind of like long johns. And usually this garment went from the waist to the knees. Now, white in color had a twofold purpose. First, it was to maintain a high degree of modesty. Now, many of the pagan religions of that day had their priests serve their gods naked, or they wore something very sensual and erotic. Second of all, it served the same practical sanitary purposes as our modern underwear does. The priest's outer garments could not be soiled by conditions of the flesh, normal or abnormal. If they were, they had to be carefully washed, and in those days, that was quite a chore. Now, over the breeches was a tunic, usually mistakenly called a coat in most Bible translations. Now, according to Josephus, the tunic was fairly tight-fitting, and it went from neck to feet. And like the breeches, it also was made of white linen. Now, generally, the only part of the tunic that could be seen was three or four inches of it down around the ankle area. Over the tunic, then, was a blue-colored robe. It was required to be seamless, so it had a slit for the priest's head to 
fit through, and then two more slits for his arms to go through. And then around the bottom of the garment, the, the hem of the garment, were blue, purple, and red pomegranates, which alternated with little metal bells made out of gold. And then this blue robe went from his neck to just below his knees. Now next, the high priest would don his ephod. It was a two-piece garment, part of it covering the chest, the other part is back. Now sometimes the ephod gets confused with the breastplate. Okay. This is because at times both of these things were called ephod. Now I suppose because they work together. Actually the ephod was what the breastplate was attached to. It was embroidered with blue, purple, and red linen yarns. And then the front and the back were separate pieces, and they were held together by a braided strap that lay over the shoulders. Two onyx stones were attached to the braided shoulder straps. Each stone was engraved with six of the tribes of Israel. Six on one side, six names on the other side. Over and attached to the ephod was the breastplate, also called the breastplate of judgment. Now this was a very interesting accessory. It was square and it had a pouch. And 12 precious stones of varying kinds were placed upon it, each of them engraved with the name of one of the Israelite tribes. And then inside that pouch were placed two very mysterious stones called the Urim and the Tumim. And the high priest then wore a turban that typically is called a mitre. And on the turban, around his forehead, he wore a gold plate with the words holiness to yud heh vav -Hey, Yehovah, inscribed on it. Well, now we've taken a quick look at the high priest's special uniform. Let's just back up and talk about some of the special aspects of these various articles of clothing. The ephod is quite interesting because it contains the names of all the tribes of Israel and it's worn over the high priest's heart. Each precious stone on the ephod had the name of one tribe of Israel on it. Twelve stones, twelve names. Conversely, the two larger stones on the shoulder straps of the ephod also carried tribal names. Six names on one, six names on the other. The twelve Separate and different kind of stones indicate that each of the 12 tribes had their own separate uniqueness, their own separate tribal identity. The two larger shoulder stones indicated that Israel is actually consists of two groups. Later on, they'll be called houses, the two houses of Israel, Ephraim and Judah. So by means of these different stones, of the ephod, we actually see that there's a threefold nature of Israel. First of all, all Israel. Second, on, second of all, the two houses of Israel. And third of all, the 12 individual tribes of Israel. Now, part of the ephod was a pouch called the Hoshen that contained the two stones that were used in this decision making process the Urim and the Tumim. Now, the exact way that these stones were used then is a mystery. However, there are some characteristics about them that we can know. For instance, they were, they were carried in, they were stored in, and was considered part of the, the ephod. All right, that is the ephod along with its breastplate. And the breastplate was also called the breastplate of, of justice or judgment in the Hebrew, Hoshen Hamishpat. Now, I hope you recall our, our lesson some time back about the words judgment and justice, which in Hebrew is mishpat. And the first thing to keep in mind is that we are not, a, not to take the use of the word judgment as it's used here as meaning wrath or punishment. Mishpat does not mean punishment. Now, Christianity typically thinks that the biblical use of the word judgment means, always means a negative consequence for something that mankind's done wrong, a divine punishment. In other words, we should not think 
of the breastplate is the name for it is the breastplate, say, of God's wrath. All right. Mishpat just most, most literally means justice. So breastplate of justice or breastplate of God's will is a better rendering according to our 21st century Western cultural minds. And with all those tribes of Israel represented on this breastplate, the idea is God is going to deal with Israel according to his system of justice. Now, as for the Urim and the Tumim, one of the most marvelous aspects of these two objects is hidden from us when we don't understand Hebrew. Urim means light. And Tumim means perfection or fulfillment. Technically, because these two words are plurals, it means lights and fulfillments or perfections. Light and perfection are perhaps the two most recognizable qualities of God Almighty. But it goes further. One of the titles given to Yehovah in the New Testament, one we're all familiar with, is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This comes from the idea that in the Greek alphabet, the alpha is the first letter, the omega is the last. In English, it's like saying A and Z. But this alpha and omega concept was hardly a New, Test New Testament revelation, because here in Exodus, the first letter of the word urim is in the Hebrew alphabet aleph, and the first letter of the word tumim is in the Hebrew alphabet tav, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So the aleph is the Hebrew equivalent to alpha, and the tav is the equivalent to the omega, alpha, omega, aleph, tav, a to z. So the urim and tumim represent parts of, uh, parts of, of God's nature. He is the first and he is the last. Now, the Urim and Tumim were apparently used in decision-making, whereby a choice from among two options needed to be made. Now, it could have been a one or the other or a yes or no type of decision. We only read of three or four places in the Old Testament where the Urim and Tumim are specifically mentioned as being used for decision-making. However, we also get a couple of more references that seem to indicate the use of these two stones, although they're not mentioned by name because the biblical passages say that a decision was arrived at by means of the ephod, which included the breastplate and that pouch that helped the Urim and the Tumim. There was no other known means of making a decision with the use of the ephod or breastplate than by using those two stones that were in the pouch, all right, the Urim and the Tumim. It also appears that after the time of King David, the Urim and the Tumim went into disuse. There are implications, though, that although the Urim and Tumim were still available, that for some reason they ceased to function as before. And so the high priest determined that God's will was no longer reflected in those stones. There is disagreement as to whether the Urim and the Tumim were even part of the high priest's uniform in the days of Yeshua. The point is that the breastplate carries an enormous prophetic symbolism with it that those Moses-led Hebrews could only have barely understood, if at all. And it was that God's nature of light and perfection is the very essence of his justice system. And that God's justice system is both applied to Israel and it will be brought to all mankind eventually through Israel. Now, if you recall our lesson on the word mishpat, you'll also recall that I told you that as God introduces his justice system back in Exodus chapter 21. He calls it his mishpat. And that his system of justice was developed to bring about 
redemption and salvation. Now we have a commonly used church word for this process. We call it the gospel. The breastplate could be characterized quite correctly as the breastplate of the gospel, as it incorporates the concepts of God's justice, of his light and perfection, and of Israel as the ideal nation through whom God would justify the whole of mankind. Now, of course, it turns out that the nation of Israel would produce a very special Israelite, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, who would be the cornerstone of God's justice. Now, another interesting item that the high priest wore was his head plate. This was a gold band that was held on with a thread. Now, this band went just above the high priest's brow line on his forehead. It read, Kodesh Yehovah, which literally means holiness to Yehovah or set apart for Yehovah. You see, the high priest was Israel's representative before God. Upon the high priest's shoulders rested either the acceptance or the rejection of all Israel. Oh, what a responsibility that man bore. And as we will see shortly in the consecration and dedication ceremony of Aaron and the other priests, the concept of substitution and God's justice system is made quite clear, and it's demonstrated in the purpose of the high priest. When the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he carries upon himself all the sin of Israel when he approaches God and he makes atonement for them. The garments worn by the high priest speak of him as being a substitute for all Israel, although interestingly, on Yom Kippur, he wears only the simplest white linen outfit into the Holy of Holies instead of his normal resplendent clothing. And the, animal sac the uh, sacrificial animal whose blood the high priest, Kohen HaGadol in Hebrew, carries, and that he will sprinkle onto the mercy seat bears the substitute death that is due mankind for our sins. This is why the New Testament speaks of Jesus as our high priest. He represents us. He carries the burden of all of our sins before God the Father. He is the substitute for all those who will believe in him. But he also had to bear the substitute death that was due to all of us. Further, it is his blood that was shed through which atonement for us was received. So Yeshua is both the high priest and the sacrificial animal, so to speak. Now, I want you to please understand that this is not allegory that I'm speaking to you, or some lovely illustration in making this comparison between Christ and the high priest of Israel. The high priest was but the shadow of who was to come, Yeshua. And the special garments that the high priest wore told the story of just how atonement and redemption would work. Now let's move on to Exodus chapter 29. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 29, page 93, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Here's what you are to do to consecrate them for ministry to me in the office of Cohen, priest. Take one young bull and two rams without defect, also matzah, matzah cakes mixed with olive oil, matzah wafers spread with oil, all made from fine wheat flour. Put them together in a basket, present them in the basket, along with the bull and the two rams. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Take the garments and put, Aaron, put on Aaron the tunic, the robe for the ritual vest, the vest itself, and the breastplate. Fasten the vest on him with its belt. 
Put the turban on his head, attach the holy ornament to the turban. Then take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. Bring his sons and put tunics on them. Wrap sashes around them. Aaron and his sons and put uh, around them Aaron and his sons and put the headgear on their heads. The office of Cohen is to be theirs by a permanent regulation. Thus you will consecrate Aaron and his sons. Bring the young bull to the front of the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the bull's head. Then you are to slaughter the bull in the presence of Aaron of Adonai at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Take some of the bull's blood and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. Pour out all the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Take all the fat that covers the inner organs, the covering of the liver, and the two kidneys with their fat, and offer them up in smoke on the altar. But the bull's flesh, skin, and dung you are to destroy by fire outside the camp. It's a sin offering. Take one of the rams. Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the ram's head. You are to slaughter the ram. Take its blood and splash it on all sides of the altar. Quarter the ram. Wash the inner organs and the lower parts of the legs. Put them on with the quarters and the head. Then offer up the whole ram in smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering for Adonai, a pleasing aroma, an offering made to Adonai by fire. Take the other ram. Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the ram's head, and you are to slaughter the ram, take some of its blood, put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the lobes of his son's right ears, on the thumbs of the right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. Take the rest of the blood and splash it on all sides of the altar. Then take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his clothing and on his sons and the clothing of his sons with him so that he and his clothing will be consecrated and with him his sons and his sons' clothing. Also take the fat from the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the inner organs, the two kidneys, the fat covering them in the right thigh for it is a ram of consecration along with one loaf of bread one cake of oiled bread, one wafer from the basket of matzah, which is before Adonai, put it all in the hands of Aaron and his sons. They are to wave them as a wave offering in the presence of Adonai. Then take them back and burn them up in smoke on the altar, on top of the burnt offering, to be a pleasing aroma before Adonai. It is an offering made to Adonai by fire. Take the breast of the ram for Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before Adonai. It will be your share. Consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of any contribution that has been waved and raised up, whether from the ram of consecration or from anything else meant for Aaron and his sons. This will belong to Aaron and his sons as their share perpetually due from the people of Israel. It will be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings, their contribution to Adonai. The holy garments of Aaron will be used by his sons after him. They will be anointed and consecrated in them. The son who becomes priest in his place, who comes into the tent of meeting to serve in the holy place, is to wear them for seven days. Take the ram of consecration and boil its meat in a holy place. Aaron and his sons will eat the ram's meat and the bread in the basket at the entrance to the tent of meeting. They are to eat the things with which atonement was made for them, to inaugurate and consecrate them, uh, consecrate them. No one else may eat this food because it's holy. If any of the meat for the consecration or any of the bread remains until morning, burn up what remains. It's not to be eaten because it's holy. Carry out these orders I have given you concerning Aaron and his sons. You are to spend seven days consecrating them. Each day offer a young bull as a sin offering besides the other offerings of atonement. Offer the sin, honoring, sin offering on the altar as your atonement for it, then anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you will make atonement on the altar and consecrate it. Thus the altar will be especially holy, and whatever touches the altar will become holy. Now this is what you are to offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, regularly every day, the one lamb you are to offer in the morning, the other lamb at dusk. With the one lamb, offer two quarts of finely ground flour mixed with one quart of oil from pressed olives, along with one quart of wine as a drink offering. 
The other lamb you are to offer at dusk. Do with it as the morning grain. Do it. Do with it as with the morning grain and drink offerings. It will be a pleasing aroma, an offering made to Adonai by fire. Through all your generations, this is to be the regular burnt offering at the entrance to the tent of meeting before Adonai. This is where I will meet with you to speak with you. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Likewise, I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me in the office of priest. Then I will live with the people of Israel and be their God. They will know that I am Adonai, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt in order to live with them. I am Adonai, their God. You know, something I just saw that really struck me. Look at verse 33 for a second. They are to eat the things with which atonement was made for them to inaugurate and consecrate them. No one else may eat this, whole, this food because it's holy. Think about what Christ did in that thing we call communion. He said, this is my body and this is my blood. Who made atonement for us? Who made atonement for us? Christ. It's exactly following this formula right here. You are to eat the things with which atonement was made for you. Isn't that interesting? And here we find it in Exodus. I want to mention something that I said a while back. What we are witness to in these last few chapters is not of God altering the principles of the religion of the Hebrews to make them different from those principles which he had taught Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, others. Nor is he challenging the Hebrew priesthood from one kind or purpose to another kind or purpose. Up to this moment in history, Israel did not have a priesthood. And its religion by now consisted mostly of what they had learned from and was in line with the Egyptians' religious system. Rather, what God is doing is the process of separating Israel step by step from the ways of the corrupt world. In their particular case, that world was Egypt. And then establishing them as a completely set apart people with a completely different religion, a nation unto themselves. And while they were indeed in process of becoming a wholly unique nation. Their purpose as a nation was also being established, and that purpose was to serve Jehovah God. And that service would be taught. It would be focused by means of this powerful priesthood that just at this moment was coming into being with Aaron as its head, its high priest. It's Kohen Hagadol. Now, some of the rituals that we see occurring here in chapter 29 are actually but one-time happenings. Because what's being described is the ceremony to consecrate the establishment of the priesthood. The consecration ceremony that takes up the bulk of this chapter. It's kind of like the ribbon-cutting of a uh, of a highway open area, busting the bottle of champagne against a ship, or the ratification of a national constitution. By design, it's only supposed to happen once. However, there are also some ongoing rituals that are being established as well. Even if they're not done precisely the same way, they're carried out in the consecration ceremony. Now, the first thing to know is that the consecration of Aaron and the priests was to be public. This was not to be a secret ceremony. Secrecy in God's economy is generally not compatible with truth and light. The people were able to observe, and it had explained to them 
what was going on, who was involved, why. The second thing to know is that what we're reading about in these chapters is only what God is instructing Moses to do. At this time, Moses is still up on the summit of Mount Sinai. So the narrative we've been reading since chapter 24 of Exodus amounts to God being quoted as he's instructing Moses. In a few more chapters, after the coming golden calf incident, then all of these instructions will actually be put into place so they can be carried out. Now, after God gave Moses a short list in verses 1 through 3 of animals and food that, they were, to be, that were to be sacrificed as part of the consecration ceremony, Moses is instructed to bring Aaron and his four sons into the outer court of the tabernacle, in front of, but not inside of, the sanctuary. And the first thing Moses has to do is wash Aaron and his sons with water. Sacrificing we've seen occurring since Adam and Eve. But this is the beginning of the ritual washing with water that will become so integral to the Le uh, Levitical system and a central feature of Israel's new way of life. So let's not rush by this. There's some important teaching buried here that's going to resurface later. Now Moses is the highest leader of Israel and, and, and therefore in God's eyes the highest earthly leaders of mankind was instructed by Jehovah to humble himself by washing the priests. The priests were considered to be lower in rank than Moses. Even Aaron was lower in rank and authority than Moses. Yet here was the most powerful man, the only man that had ever talked with God face to face, reduced to performing a task that usually only women or servants did, washing others. I know what's going through your minds already. At least I hope it is. This had to be quite a shocking sight to the people of Israel who lived in a world to where the social class you belonged to was everything. The idea that your supreme leader would stoop and wash a lesser person? Well, that's just unthinkable. Was the idea to humble Moses? Was that the point of having Moses wash the priests? No. The idea was all about the priests being prepared and consecrated into service for God. But first, they had to be cleansed from impurity in God's eyes, and the method God established to accomplish this included ritual washing. Yet there indeed was significance in Moses doing the washing because it demonstrated that the cleansing of the people could only occur from on high, and it had to be a merciful, a loving act. Now catch this. Hundreds of years later, the Bible was going to show us a replay of this very incident about Moses washing the priests. This time, we're going to find it in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, when Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Yeshua, the highest leader on earth, Jesus the Master, Messiah, God incarnate, humbles himself as a servant. Why is he doing this? What's the significance of that act? In my opinion, this is the consecration ceremony of the new spiritual priesthood. Just as it was that Moses the mediator, who acted on God's behalf to establish the earthly, physical priesthood 
So it was that Yeshua the mediator established the spiritual, heavenly priesthood built upon faith and trust in him. Now listen to but one of the many New Testament passages that I firmly believe confirms my conclusion on this matter. In 1 Peter 2, 1 through 5, we read this. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And coming to him as a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's explained right there. Now, first, because of, frankly, too much false teaching running on muck in the Hebrew Roots movement. Notice that believers have not become the new and replacement physical and earthly priesthood. You have not replaced the Levitical priesthood. Rather, it is the spiritual element that's being addressed. It is from the spiritual point of view, as the verse says, a spiritual house for a holy priesthood in, offer, in order to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Second of all, remember that all who follow Christ, all of Messiah's disciples, are as priests. We in this room, Jew, Gentile, we who have turned the lordship of our lives over to Yeshua are his priests, or as the Bible calls us, a kingdom of priests or a holy house of priests. There is absolutely not a doubt in my mind that the startled, startled and bewildered disciples of Yeshua could not have made that connection between what Yeshua was doing to them by washing their feet and what Moses had done 1,300 years earlier by washing Aaron and his sons. Moses is consecrating Aaron and his sons as the first priesthood of Israel by washing them with water. And it was a shadow a type, a pattern of what Christ would do as he consecrated his disciples as the spiritual order of priests for the spiritual heavenly ideal of Israel, the priests who would serve the spiritual kingdom of God. Now, naturally, Yeshua performed this consecration in the same way Moses did, in his role as mediator. He personally performed a ritual washing of these new priests. So what Yeshua HaMashiach did on that day was even more powerful and had much higher meaning than simply his showing by example that a master must be meek and a humble servant to his people. It meant much more than that. That's usually the limited teaching we get about that event. If we don't know and we don't understand the Torah, the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, the true and profound symbolism of Messiah washing the feet of his disciples just goes right over our heads. It's ironic that within the same paragraph that says that Yeshua's disciples form a spiritual priesthood, we also have this instruction. Therefore, putting aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. You notice that? It is by studying the word of God that we grow in respect to our salvation. It's not that reading the word brings us salvation. It is that once saved, the word becomes our source of growth in our salvation. The only word that existed in this era 
was what was called the Old Testament, the first five books of which are called the Torah. I mean, what a tragic mistake the church made so long ago in declaring the Old Testament to be all but dead and gone, certainly of no value to believers. Because Peter clearly states, as Yeshua, Paul, John, and others, that the Old Testament scripture is what they valued as truth. And it is the place we are to continue to go to in order to find truth, to grow our faith, to grow our understanding. This is most certainly not to imply that the New Testament is somehow defective or less than that. It's not what I'm saying. Rather, it's to say that the Old Testament is as valid and relevant as it was in ancient times. And with the return of Israel as a nation of Jews, pretty prophetic milestone, the Old Testament has reemerged as scripture of critical importance concerning our day and age. It's not just history. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this ceremony in Exodus chapter 29 with Moses washing the priests was kind of a one-time deal. From here on, neither Moses nor anyone else washed the priests. Rather, each individual was charged with the ritual washing of himself. The principle God was demonstrating by means of his establishment of ritual washing was regeneration. That is the principle that explains that we must be made anew. We have to be regenerated in order to be cleansed from the results of our sin before God. The Hebrews had to do these washings countless times through their lifetimes, through the centuries. Because each ritual washing had an effect which was just temporary in nature. The ritual washing was required for a huge list of reasons, <laughs> which we'll cover in a few weeks. Well, after being washed, Aaron and his sons are to put on the special priest's garments that God has instructed is to be made for them. Their old clothing represents who they were. Their new clothing represents who they are now, before God. Then the priests are anointed by having a special anointing oil loaded up with expensive spices poured over them. Now, by the way, we'll find later in Leviticus, even later still in the Talmud, that there was a certain manner in which this anointing was to be done. The oil had to be poured over their heads in a sufficient quantity that it ran not only down their faces and dripped off of their beards, but that it flowed all the way down to the hem of their garments. These were some oily people when this was over. They are never going to rust. Not only was this really messy, but by tradition the oil was poured, this is really interesting, Poured first left to right, back to front, in the shape of a cross, if you would. How about that for prophetic symbolism? The anointing of holy oil was symbolic and prophetic of Pentecost. That time when the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, could anoint man made possible by Yeshua's sacrifice on the cross. And as we keep moving through all these ritual processes in Exodus and Leviticus, take notice how the physical act that we see in the Torah, in the Old Testament, is always prophetic. It's always symbolic of the spiritual realities of the New Testament. That is, the Old Testament rituals were teachings and demonstrations and, and, and copies and patterns and shadows of what the future spiritual reality would be. But let's be clear. They were also very real, and they were efficacious. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. Beginning in verse 10, a series of sacrifices is called for with Moses officiating. Moses officiates. Why? He's not the priest. He officiates because until the consecration ceremony is complete, there's no official priesthood to do it. So Moses acts in God's stead. 
Now recall back in chapter 24 when the ritual of sealing the covenant of Moses was happening, God ordered Moses to build a stone altar and to sacrifice animals upon it. But it was not priests that performed those sacrifices because there weren't any priests yet. Rather, it was some young men selected. They were households, firstborn males, who officiated the sacrificing. A bullock, called an ox or a bull, was to be brought into the outer court area of the tabernacle near the tent of meeting, the sanctuary. And of course, the sacred tent was right next to the brazen altar. Israel now receives a visual demonstration of the meaning of the principle of substitution. The priests all lay their hands on the bull. This represents a transference of the priest's sins onto that innocent bull. This bull then becomes their substitute. The bull now bears the sin that was once their sin. The bull is then killed, skinned, and cut up into pieces. Some of the bull's blood is captured in a ceremonial bronze pail, and the blood is splashed onto the bottom of the altar. Some is spread onto the horns of the altar. Normally, a bull would have been tied to one of the, bra uh, one of the horns on the brazen altar, but not in this case. Part of what is happening here was not only the consecration of the priests, but also the consecration of the tabernacle itself, of all the utensils, even of the brazen altar. Until the bull was killed, until its blood was spilled and used to cleanse the altar, the altar wasn't even fit for use. But once that was accomplished, then the meat of the sacrificial animal can then be burned, burned up on the altar. And notice that the parts of the bull that were placed on the altar did not include the bull's flesh, only the fat that covered its inner organs was placed on the altar. The entire remainder of the animal, including the meat, the bones, the hide, that was taken outside the encampment of Israel, and it was burned up and offered up as what's called a sin offering. Now, in the Bible, you see, the fat is considered the most valuable part of the animal. So, only the most valuable part of the animal was offered to God on the brazen altar in this special sacrifice, this sacrifice of consecration. The rest of the animal was not offered up on the brazen altar and not even within the camping area of Israel. In fact, I believe this very first sacrifice of a bull in the tabernacle was the model for another and very special sacrifice utilizing a red heifer that would come later. Now I mention this because those of you who like prophecy know that the sacrifice of a red heifer is going to be an important requirement for the, the dedication, actually the consecration of a new temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem one day, and I don't think very long from now. Now, you see, we have to take notice of a most unusual and mysterious feature of this inaugural sacrifice of the bull, and later on of a red heifer. Because in both cases, the sacrifice is not offered in a holy place. Not even in a ritually clean place, as you would think but rather they happen in an unclean place outside the camp of Israel. A good rule of thumb to understand Old Testament biblical lingo is that outside the camp is an important phrase, and it refers to that area which is considered ritually impure. All the normal and regular sacrifices that Israel had to perform were to occur only upon the brazen altar, which of course was inside the camp and was ritually pure. pure. I'll talk more about all that at an appropriate time. Next, beginning in verse 16, another burnt offering is made, only this time he uses a ram, a male sheep. Once again, 
Aaron and his sons lay hand on the animal, thus identifying the ram as their representative, their substitute. The ram is slain, its blood is collected, the ram's cut up into quarters. There is a ritual washing of the inner organs. Now the ram can be burnt up on the brazen altar because the previous sacrifice of the bull had consecrated the altar into use. Now can be used for its intended purpose. Then a second ram is sacrificed following the same procedure as with the first. But this time, some of the ram's blood is dabbed onto the right earlobes of Aaron and his sons, then their right thumbs, then their big toes. Now they're bloody and oily. They are really a mess when this thing was done. I remember what we learned about the directions right and left. Right is always the more important, the more holy side or direction, just as east is the most holy and important of the four map directions. This will play out all through the Bible. Then some of the ram's blood is sprinkled onto the priests in their clothing. Some of the fat of this ram, along with matzah, unleavened bread. Remember, leaven is a symbol of sin. So except in rare instances, the bread used in rituals is not leavened. Then it's given to the priest, and they offer it up as a wave offering. And literally, this means they hold it up over their shoulders and their heads, and they move it back and forth in a waving motion. Then they take the wave offering, they put it on the brazen altar, and that's burned up. The breast of the ram is then set aside for Moses, and Moses offers it as a wave offering, and then he can use it for his own food. Aaron and his sons were then given the remaining portion of the ram. They boiled it, and they sat at the entrance to the sanctuary at the front door, and they ate it there. Now, most elements of this consecration ceremony were to be repeated for seven consecutive days. Why seven days? Because seven's the number of God. It's the ideal number. This was established going back to the creation itself. In fact, there's a much intended connection between the creation story and the establishment of Israel, and we're going to see several more common elements of that connection appear as we go along. Now, beginning in verse 38, a fairly general outline of everyday sacrifices is given. This is much expanded in the book of Leviticus. And we'll look at each type of offering and significance in the study of Leviticus. And by the way, do not think that the study of these rituals is boring or trivial. If you want to understand the nature of sin and sacrifice, you have to read and understand and study the book of Leviticus. This chapter of Exodus ends with God reminding Israel yet again of who he is and who they are. And that with this completed consecration of the tabernacle and the priesthood, God can now do the thing that he so de desires to do with his people. He can dwell with them. Over and over we see this sort of statement in the Torah. And for a very good reason. At the moment, these three million Hebrews were still far more Egyptian in their thinking than they were Israelite. The radical new ways God was showing them would take time, it would take repetition, it would take visual demonstrations, it would take God's firm hand of discipline for them to grasp it. In fact, it would take the better part of 40 years for Israel to change significantly enough that God would even allow them to set foot in the promised land of Canaan. We'll begin chapter 30 next time.